to make sense of distress in the context of COVID-19. Um, uh, the this concept uh, we are uh, we are just denoting it as distress, but it will include a lot of um, areas in terms of psychological distress, social, spiritual, and also we'll touch upon burnout and grief and loss, loss and grief. So we'll be going through each of these areas and giving a kind of comprehensive outline of it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the learning objectives of today is to understand the relevance of psychological, social uh, 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 issues in COVID-19. And we'll just um, look at what we, all these content has been taken by what has, uh, you know, from the evidence, what we have got over the preparation of the resource toolkit. So it is to also to learn to identify and assess emotional distress and have a knowledge of specific issues in COVID-19. We'll also... Uh, learn to use the algorithm in the ebook to address and manage psychosocial distress and to have an understanding of spiritual distress and of course laws and grief so i hope uh, you have downloaded the ebook the link is given in this slide also and it has been shared to you over you know all sessions over the week and also if you had a chance i hope you have listened to the webinar as well and have kind of have a grasp of what we are going to discuss today so we'll just be pointing out certain relevant points i would request all of you to go back and read the ebook they have a there is a special uh, um, supporting document on psychosocial issues and also we have specific pages on burnout and grief so please uh, go and read it or uh, i would be very happy if i knew that you have already gone through it uh, next uh, next slide please so let us uh, base no minute uh, and go back to Ramesh. So today, again, we are going back to Ramesh and his family and we discussed the end of life yesterday. So let us look at how we are going to manage distress at various times in this journey. So we have been, we started off from how we would, you know, triage him, you know, tell him how, what kind of care he would get, where he would go, not, you know, avoiding uh, aggressive interventions. And then we also talked about how we would talk to him in communication issues. We talked about how we are managing the refractive symptoms. And yesterday we also talked about end of life care. But then we are going back again to look at the distress at various times. So I'm bringing back certain statements in the case narrative that we had brought about over the week. So I'm just going to read out to you so that you will, you will get a sense of what we had actually picked up over this week. So he's clearly anxious. So Ramesh, is clearly anxious and unsettled when he became COVID positive. And he, he keeps asking to, his, to his, see his family when he was isolated. And he's really fearful and he's asking, will I ever see them again? On the other side, the family members are tearful. They want someone to be with their father when he's alone and you know, in the isolation or you know, even when his situation has worsened. And he, they tell the team that we never would leave him alone to suffer. We feel like we have abandoned him. And the team, you know, the team who's taking care of both of them and also, you know, uh, looking at several issues at, you know, at the same time, you find that you yourself, you're anxious and you're not sleeping. And you're wondering if you'll pass the virus to the members of your own family. So you can see that there are several kinds of issues that are coming up. So I just want you all to think about these and think about the three um, questions that have come up here, looking at this narrative is that how will you respond to the situation? How will you address the family's distress? And how are these staff members feeling? I would be very happy if you start bringing in points in the chat book. I'll just wait for a minute for that. Any thoughts on what the family is going through or what Ramesh is going through and how would we actually address their distress and what is the state of the staff team members of, you know, uh, who's taking care of them in the hospital. All right, I'll, I'll give you time to kind of think through it. Next slide, please. So acknowledge the fear, good. I can see that. So when we, when we kind of start looking into this, or prepare ourselves to, in the sense of, 
you know, when you, you are so focused on managing uh, COVID-19 in terms of its symptoms and you're so worried about the, the fear of the, the transmission and all other things that sometimes we tend to really, though we are distressed, we don't really acknowledge it. So Tandi's uh, point is very, very um, relevant. We should all also be prepared. We should know that who are actually at risk to develop psychological distress. So people who are quarantined and isolated like our own Ramesh and his family, people who contract the, the disease or who is seen with the infection like Ramesh, vulnerable populations. So vulnerable populations like, you know, people who are, you know, women who are pregnant, uh, elderly population, children, some children have actually got the infection. So there are a lot of vulnerable populations, migrant populations. So you have certain groups of people globally who are actually at risk of getting the infection more than others. So those populations, comorbidities, just like a Ramesh who has got other infection, other systemic diseases like you know, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, renal failure, cardiac uh, morbidity, any kind of um, associated physical illness would actually have more issues and they're at the risk of worsening. Those who encounter loss, anyone who encounters loss, you could have someone who has actually lost someone in the family and then the, they themselves becoming COVID positive and worsening to having a uh, you know, having an infection. So we, we should be very clear about the family also when if they have lost someone. So you are actually not only looking at, the, at Ramesh, but his family too. And then you have the health workers and the carers. I think a very important group of people which actually is being acknowledged these days in social media and other aspects in, you know, in evidence also that we are seeing in how much stress and distress that they also face, how much of risk they take. So these are the people with risk to develop distress. I'll just go to the chat once and look into the points. I'm sure that Charu and uh, Moira are really taking care of it. Yeah, listen and explore their concerns. Very good. Listen with compassion and empathy. Address the fears, if possible, a video family conference. Very good point. Um, let them know we are with you and we understand your feeling. Clear communication, reassure the family. Honesty, very good points. Staff themselves may be quite distressed, wondering how they can make this easier for the family and Ramesh. I agree with you, Edwina, and also about, you know, when they make it easier for the family and Ramesh, how, how easy it is for them. I think their distress is also very, very important. Reassure them. Great to reassure and watch. Yes, very good points. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going into the concept of distress now. So let us look into this uh, this. Uh, kind of picture that I'm giving you in this slide. So you can see a person whom I've meant is healthy, which is green, and going up to the state of being ill. So from healthy, reacting, then getting injured, and then becoming ill. So this is, this is like a, you know, the journey or a pathway that a person can go through when he's, you know, exposed to a lot of stimuli around him. So, you know, which is, which is that when, especially when a person is at risk, they kind of start reacting very quickly. I mean, as normally, we all, we all have normal mood fluctuations. We go from phases of sadness to joy to anxiety. But we try as much as possible to be calm and take things in stride, don't we? And we, are, we try to cope with our own inner resources and with resources outside, like the family. And when you start reacting, actually, then you slightly become more irritable, you become impatient. There could be, you know, more of nervousness. and then even the sadness, you know, which is very transient in the beginning when you are coping quite well, that can lead to a sense of being overwhelmed. Um, for an example, for example, is now you know with the with the so many things happening in India, yeah, we we lost a celebrity actor to uh, see a, he took his own life, and immediately we also have this in parallel we lost a lot of soldiers in the India-China border so there is a lot of you know we we are mo many of us are kind of overwhelmed by what is happening around us and this can actually lead to more of injury and then you go into being more anger the irritability can turn into anger the nervousness can turn into anxiety and the sadness can become more pervasive and then a certain sense of hopelessness comes and when then it becomes a real state of illness there is aggressiveness there is panic attacks the anxiety becomes excessive panic attacks the person is not able to cope and the pervasive sadness leads to depression and suicidal thoughts. Suicide is very important as we know. 
So this journey can be in any aspect of our emotions or behavior or any, any kind of response. So it could be in terms of our, you know, our sense of humor, we would be performing well. Sleep, sleep, very importantly, we, we have, we should have at least an adequate, you know, hours of sleep a day. So when we have very few difficulties in the beginning, then when you start reacting, you have start having trouble sleeping, becoming disturbed, and then you can't fall asleep at all. Similarly, for your physical energy, your social behavior, your mingling with others, and most importantly, I think one aspect is use of substance, substance use, like, you know, having no limited alcohol use to control alcohol use, increased, and then leading into dependence or, you know, leading into acute intoxication or withdrawal. So very importantly, any of the aspects of our own emotions, behaviors, or, you know, our thoughts can go through this journey and reach a state of illness. Let me just go to the set, chat area. Yeah, empathetic and compassionate, um, appropriate pause during conversations. For us saying, yes, we can reassure about our concerns, but that we'll not abandon them. Yeah, the sense of, you know, maintaining that trust and empathy is very important. Next slide, please. So again, uh, I'll just uh, go through it once again. What are the common manifestations of the distress? So Ramesh, as we saw, we, he was anxious. He was very fearful. He has been having a sense of being abandoned by others. So it could be very emotional in terms of feeling anxious, worried, thoughts about our own one's own health. Ramesh was also worried about his grandchildren, so he, about their loved ones. Sadness, low mood, difficulty in concentrating, loss of interest, trouble relaxing. You know, emotional issues can also present with physical symptoms and physical signs like, you know, tachycardia, increased heart rate, agitation. Like we looked into agitation when it becomes very severe. We looked into how we can manage it when agitation is due to anxiety. And when agitation is with disorientation, that is delirium. People can also present with other physical symptoms like, you know, having abdominal pain, stomach upset. Multiple aches and pains like headache, neck ache, low back ache, any kind of pain. So uh, anxiety and other, you know, emotional issues can present with many things like, you know, which will, it can be giddiness, it can be, you know, shortness of breath. So we have to be really alert and we should understand about how they can present. Behaviorally, they can present as, you know, being very tired, changes in eating patterns, either you don't eat at all and you withdraw or you can have a spree of eating so much, you know, have a craving to eat, difficulty sleeping and aggression. So in some people, there can be a worsening of pre-existing symptoms like this. There can be, a, you could see a lot of people with existing mental health problems of anxiety or depression or, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. There's a lot of uh, mental health disorders. They could be worsening of it. They could be worsening of chronic health problems also, the, the, you know, the diabetes, the hypertension, increased use of substance, like I said. But the real red flag signs are, you know, agitation, like we have mentioned, confusion and disorientation as part of delirium, substance use, and of course, hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations and delusions, I hope you are aware of hallucinations and delusions. They are psychotic features. And uh, they can be part of delirium. They can be part of substance use. They can be part of psychosis. So any, any kind of acute, you know, when the person gets far away from the reality and most importantly, suicidal ideation. I would like to hear something about these red flag signs from you in terms of psychosis as well as suicidal ideation, because I think that's very important to understand. So would you actually talk to a person? Would you be, um, would you, do you usually ask people about suicidal ideation? How do you ask them? Agitation and confusion, difficult to differentiate from hypoxia. Yeah, hypoxia is uh, a, a stay. Uh, hypoxia is not the, the behavioral response. Hypoxia can cause agitation and confusion. So hypoxia would lead to delirium, which would cause agitation and confusion. So uh, we should understand that agitation, the hypoxia is one of the causes of agitation and confusion. Agitation and confusion. Agitation is restlessness, mostly a subjective and objective type. Like you have a physical component to it and an emotional component to it. And confusion is when the person is not able to really comprehend things going, comprehend things going around him. But then disorientation is when the person completely has, you know, loses, um, you know, the, his 
ability to react to time, place, and person. So when you want to ask uh, a person about disorientation, you ask them questions to, you know, what's the time, where are you, and who is this beside you? Very simple questions. So that is disorientation. Confusion is not comprehending things and becoming, you know, not aware of what's going. But then there is the level of consciousness is, is uh, normal. Uh, did I make sense to it? Yeah, hypoxia is by monitoring for PO2. That is uh, a cause for delirium or agitation or confusion. Did I make that clear? To who were uh, yes, yes. Dr. Okay. Adinaran? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I would also like you all to respond to uh, like the question I had asked about suicidal ideation. Would you? Have you, uh, you know, do you routinely ask people coming in distress about suicidal ideation and how would you ask it? Uh, any, any kind of, uh, how do you do? Well, wait for those answers and get on to the next slide. Next slide, please. I think the answers are coming, Chitra. I think, yeah. Yeah, I'll wait for, I'll look for it. Okay. Questions should be non-judgmental. Yes. So this is actually a, a tool or a protocol, which is called the nurse protocol. These are, there are many tools and I'm sure that you, you heard about the spikes uh, tool yesterday from Dr. Biju in terms of the day before, in terms of how to, you know, um, deliver news, which is very, very um, distressing, like what we call as breaking bad news. But this is another protocol or a tool that you can use. And this is, you have this in the ebook also. I'll just go through it. It's about how you can empathize, how you can explore further into the distress of the person. So you can actually, you know, yeah. You might want to, you, people are answering your question. They're saying they okay. don't know how to ask about suicidal ideation. All right, I'll just go back to it. I have never openly asked and I don't know how to. Important question, yeah. Usually suicidal persons are very secretive. I hear what you're saying. It's a natural reaction to you. I just, I think, um, uh, there is actually an understanding that, you know, uh, in many and most people, I mean, we are actually very uh, scared or fearful of asking about suicide because we feel or we believe that if we ask about, you know, thoughts or, you know, ide ideas about ending life, we believe, we fear that the person will actually go and do it. And we also think that, like somebody said, that suicidal persons are very secretive. And uh, evidence says that it is not so. It is not so because once you start, then you, people actually are open to talk, talking about it. If you give them a chance to talk, and that's where you have a number of suicide helplines for suicides, where, where there's a chance at least, and we encourage people who feel this to call someone before, you know, when they are very anxious or that they have this urge. Because once you kind of, you know, actually diffuse that situation, you actually reduce the urge or the impulse to do the act. So, and they actually give you hints. They actually express about these ideas of death in different ways, like saying that I'm not interested in anything anymore, or everything looks gloomy, life is hopeless, I want to end everything. So they actually are not very secret. They might not come and tell us that they want to end or they are going to commit an act to end their lives, but they would probably say, it's, uh, you know, I don't have any wish anymore. It's hopeless, it's very dark and gloomy. In the, in, you know, in the way, in your own language. So how can we frame a question to expose suicidal thoughts? But what I would do is probably when I, you know, once I establish the rapport and when I, once I have, you know, uh, the trust of the person by exploring further, I would ask them, uh, how are they coping? How is the situation? How are they coping with the situation? And are they coping well? Uh, uh, do they feel frustrated, you know? Is it becoming very hard? And in this moments of frustrations, do they think that it is no longer going to work? And then I would also ask that, have you ever thought that nothing is going to, you know, be okay again and I have to end this all? So it is not asking them directly with a question, but build it slowly. And then once you go there, I think, you know, once you establish that rapport and start asking, they will themselves tell you. And I can assure you that uh, people actually would reveal and you can actually help them. And you can actually, if you, if you talk to them at that, that appropriate time, you are actually helping the suicide rates come down. That's the, what evidence says. Okay, Dr. Dinesh Kumar says, some people in this situation feel that death is better than life. 
Have you ever had such thoughts? Ensure that we appear non-judgmental and suggestive. I totally agree with you. Absolutely right. I mean, they do say, they might say that this life is no longer good for me. I think I should just go away. So that is the way they would uh, like, yeah, are you happy in life? Very good questions of asking. Okay. So let me go back to the nurse protocol. So you are actually, so this is again a protocol which you can use and then go further to explore for uh, suicidal ideations. Like you're mirroring the emotion. So you can say that you seem very angry. You can even say that I can see that you're very sad. I can see you are withdrawn. I see that you're not, uh, you're, you don't, uh, you know, interact with people in your family. So it's, and you understand the emotion, say that how stressful this could be. Respect the feelings of the person or the caregiver and support them. You know, I think we should always find, you know, I would always ask any, I mean, even if we are taking care of them, we should find out that anybody around their, you know, in their horizon who can offer them support, emotional or social support. And always explore the emotion with an open question, like tell me more, more about your concerns. So if a person is going to say that, oh, I am feeling really low or, you know, I don't want to, this, I'm not happy at all. Ask them, you know, rather than assuming from that, that, okay, this, this is due to COVID that he's saying, or this is due to that. Or, you know, we usually assume that we, like in palliative care, if the person has severe pain and the person says that I'm not happy, we immediately assume that he is unhappy because of the pain. So that is one example. So let us not assume what is actually causing the unhappiness. Let us ask them and facilitate that process of them coming out with those thoughts about what's happening with them. I'm just going to the chat once more. Okay. Regular uh, assessment of depression, the tools like PHQ-9. Yes, PHQ-9 is a simple tool which has been actually in evidence shown that it can be used in the primary care to pick up symptoms of depression. It has been taken from uh, DSM diagnostic and statistical manual and it has uh, been proved to be very effective uh, for people in uh, you know their settings but even then i think people would need to be slightly you know aware and trained to use this so one cannot just use it offhand but people have to be trained sometimes denial of the emotion when we name the emotions such as i see you angry the first uh, is the first response how do we work around it so when you, when you say that, okay, I can see that you are angry, then you, you actually tell them that, can we just sit down? Like you combine your skills, like, you know, the communication skills that you learned, say that I can see that you are very upset. Can we just sit down for a few minutes and discuss about it? I want to spend some time, to know, time with you to know more about it. So usually when people are angry, the, our first reaction is to be angry. You know, the, it's reacting rather than being proactive, you know, so, we should step back from reacting to them and be more proactive and ask them, explore further to what to do. And once, and remember in anger, anger is actually an, a kind of an explosive kind of emotion. It goes up and then comes down. So we, ha we let them actually use that time to actually, when you ask them to sit down and when they know that you are actually being empathetic, empathetic then the anger comes down and they are much more easier to talk to. But I, can, I know that there are situations when they can be very difficult and then you then move, remove yourself from the situation saying that I can see that we are not able to really converse because of uh, these issues. Can we talk tomorrow and find a better you know, time to talk to? Uh, Dr. Anupama, does that sound good? If the person is an introvert, we face challenges, then we have to take more time. How? Yeah, sit with them. See, or they, the... I think uh, as clinicians or as carers, we also have, you know, we want to kind of complete the sessions very quickly. Like even in terms of giving them bad news, like breaking bad news. We, I always see the question like, you know, I have already told him about, you know, that he's got this issue, this cancer, but they come and ask again. So we actually think that one session is enough for them. Maybe it is not. There are some people who will need much more time to, you know, establish that rapport with you you know, trust you, you know, people don't trust very easily. So you can't expect them to trust in one session. So you might have to spend more time to use your team effectively. You know, if you are not able to really establish that kind of a rapport, ask one of your nurses or your social worker or any team member who probably has much more of a skill to talk to people. You can actually talk to them. Your help, take their help. So I think that should be done. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so I think we just touched upon, you know, the emotional responses, how do we communicate with them, how do we touch upon difficult, uh, you know, issues like even suicide. So we are going back to the narrative again in terms of managing distress. Look at um, with Ramesh and his family. So one of the doctors in the team actually has been asked to vacate his flat and his neighbor actually shoes him away when he dropped in at his flat. And this is becoming very common where health workers are really, you know, treated with fear. I mean, people are actually very, very fearful, you know, to, you know, they are so, uh, they don't want to anything uh, with COVID nearby. So when people come from doctors, I mean, I myself in my flat, when I get into the flat, many of the, my, you know, neighbors actually stay outside, you know, thinking that I'm coming from the hospital. So I have more risk of bringing the virus. And in the, in, in the midst of this, the treating physician also snaps at his, uh, you know, team nurse who shows anxiety in going near Ramesh sons to give up the updates. So the nurse has to have the role of going and giving updates to Ramesh son. And she didn't go and the treating physician actually snaps at him. And the nurse breaks down and says, whatever I do doesn't seem to help anyone. This is the feeling of helplessness and overwhelm that I, I said, oh, you know, being overwhelmed, you know, like, and you try so hard these days, you know, with the limited resources, with whatever we have to do, wearing the mask, wearing the PPE, you know, maintaining social distance, you know, you are role as changing. So we, this is, this is an issue which is coming up. What are the specific issues of the pandemic, especially related to the healthcare team? And what will be the strategies we can take to improve these situations? Can I have some of your thoughts in these two aspects? Like what are the specific issues of pandemic, especially related to the healthcare team and what will be the strategies we can take to improve these situations? So Moira is asking, have any of you found the stigma directed to you? And Mariam says, yes, it's true. I had that experience in Senegal where I had to do the communication over and over. Okay, it's about, you know, having to repeatedly communicate and sometimes repetition becomes, a, you know, exhausts us also. So I think we should use a team very effectively in terms, you know, if you feel exhausted, it is valid that you take a break and you can ask one of your team members to join in and help you do the job. So any, any thoughts on what uh, Moira asked? Aisha says, yes, I have had this experience with my extended family. They did not feel comfortable for me coming close to them. Yes, very, very true. I think it's happening all over globally in various forms. I'm not sure whether, you know, it's happened. Is it, does it happen in UK, Moira? Definitely people who have been asked to live, vacate their premises. Um, and it's a big problem actually all over the world, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, yeah. Uh, Hema says, my junior and ICU tested positive. And Charu says, everyone should convey similar message. Team is anxious about contracting the illness and ostracism from society. Healthcare team catching the infection. Very important points. I'll go to the next slide. Meanwhile, I would also like you to think about what would the strategies that you would use in terms of. So let us let me come back to stigma that uh, Moira pointed out. So stigma means that people are labeled, stereotyped, discriminated against treated separately and experience loss of status. So you can see this doctor who's actually in a lift where it's labeled Corona lift and others are not allowed. So this is what's happening where you are just separated from others. So, and um, it is along with the other uh, responsibilities that you carry in terms of taking care of persons with COVID, you also carry this um, fear of being, you know, discriminated. And often when you go back home after the week for the weekend, you are treated with fear and that kind of demoralizes you. So um, what could be the strategies that you could use for stigma? Utter helplessness and guilt when the patient requests to see his sons and threatens to report to the media. Palliative care team with their biopsychosocial and spiritual have much to contribute in this trying time. I agree completely with you, uh, Dr. Pranab. I think uh, we are, the palliative care is an ideal kind of, you know, your team, which is already kind of, you know, we have faced a lot of this in various forms and, uh, you know, sh and we uh, are prepared also in terms of, you know, the mortality, how to communicate. And we sometimes, even palliative care has faced stigma when our vehicle goes to the community. We are, oh, we say, oh, they are coming because the patient is dying. So we actually, actually, it looks like as if we uh, bring in death kind of thing. So we are quite used to it. And we, with our approach, are very, 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 good at uh, looking at these things so when i speak to patients i start by saying i'm downed in ppe only as okay that's a good point of 
actually. I think explanations and information is the way ahead for stigma. So giving them the right information, the right amount of information, appropriate information, and also there's a lot of information carrying videos. The National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience in Bangalore, India, has brought about a lot of educational video, videos in several languages about stigma so that people can watch and understand that the fear they have is actually normal, but then it's in, they can actually learn from this and appropriately respond to the situations and people around them. We need to sit. Yeah, let me go to the chat again. We need to spread awareness with accurate information, eliminate misconceptions, and allow normalization. A COVID modification. I'll care with them just as always. Yes, PPE is a COVID modification, and you will care for them just as always. Very good, very good point. And even like PPE, and you cannot see their face. People are wearing stickers with smileys, you know, to to, to diffuse the situation. Yes, very good points. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm coming uh, to another concept or, you know, another, see, this is all distress and distress is an, you know, what we call in all these concepts. So there's something called moral distress, compassion, fatigue, and burnout. I'll just go through the definitions very quickly so that some people are not aware of it. So moral distress is related to the situation in which clinicians are asked to carry out acts that run contrary to their moral beliefs. Like when you are asked to tell people that there are no beds or there are this shortage of ventilators, you will not be able to admit people. That is a moral distress that the clinician would carry because it's about something which they cannot control. You know, there is a lack of facility and you're, you have to tell people coming with COVID-19, no, we cannot take care of you. And that is a very, very strong, you know, very, very difficult situation. Compassion fatigue is something which evolved specifically from the relationship between the clinician and the patient. So you take care of the person and you continuous, you know, you are in the situation taking care you, bring, you actually give 110% of yourself in terms of energy and emotions. And it can, leave, you know, it can leave you fatigued and exhausted because of the compassion itself. And the burnout aspect stresses that arise from the clinician's interaction with the work and environment. And all this distress, remember the journey that I said from the green and the red. These distress can go through the same journey. So it can start as minimum mild symptoms to moderate to state of injury and then being ill. Next slide, please. So burnout is a concept which has got, you know, it's been defined and it's been researched upon. Burnout has been uh, studied, like staff stress is one area that has been looked into. And this has been um, seen in, especially in, uh, you know, physicians and in nurses and in palliative care, this has been Look, because palliative care is exposed to a lot of morbidity and mortality. So this has been defined as having three components, like one is emotional exhaustion, where there is a feeling of energy depletion and exhaustion. And I'm sure that, can I ask each one of you or you know, any one of you, whether you feel any of these right now? I do feel it. I just do feel a bit exhausted. I do feel it. And I do feel some kind of sometimes, you know, a sense of, mental distance from the job, you know, how long is this going on? So this uncertainty about the situation, the change in the roles, the change in the way we are working, everything kind of pushes you into a state of exhaustion, you know, looking at suddenly becoming very negative or cynical related to your own job. And actually, like the nurse said, remember the nurse said that whatever I do doesn't seem to help anyone. So this is, there's a sense of low personal accomplishment, like there is a reduced professional efficacy. So I am not able to, I feel so helpless. I'm not able to really do what I really want to do. So this is, I, I, I'm sure that at least one point of it would have crossed off my, crossed in our minds when going through this period, even otherwise, because we are all working in, you know, very stressful situations all the time. Okay, let me go to the chat again. Yes, low personal accomplishment from Rajini. Yeah. Edwina, yep, Moira, for sure. I agree, Dr. Jagrati, Dinesh, occasionally yes to all three. I, I would say the same, Dr. Dinesh, occasionally yes to all the three. Le, um, Lel is saying, I fully agree. Minakshi, simple actions have become complex. Absolutely true. You know, you feel that everything becomes a chore, isn't it? I mean, actually, we would welcome having a vacation, isn't it? And this is actually like an imposed vacation of, uh, on us, like a lockdown. Your workers suddenly become less. But still, you feel overwhelmed and stressful. What an irony, isn't it? Uh, Mariam says, yes, it does happen. I agree, Dr. Chitra, to your feelings. Dr. Pranam says, Aisha, yes, it does. 
all right let's go to the next slide so this is something which you should be very aware of because i think you should be aware of within yourself and in others and if you identify that you should manage that and then the nurse breaks down and says whatever i do doesn't seem to help anyone neither the patient or the family and she adds my life is worthless i have no hope how am i going to cope i haven't got my salary for the last 3 months despite working hard so what are the issues to focus on focus on in these situations like when someone says my work, life is worthless and i have no hope what else would you think of i'll just wait for a minute and then go forward i'm seeing a lot of depersonalization in me and my colleagues so true dr sanjeev i hope you take care of yourself and i hope if you need help please ask someone who can help you in terms of you know people are trained to you know even i'll just go through how we can manage it but then we ourselves should realize that we we may need help at some point so can what are the issues that we can uh, think of in terms of worthlessness hopelessness there can be significant personal issues at home very true you know you could have your own family members or you yourself going through you know difficult situations physically or emotionally appreciate her competencies and hard working very good can we go to the next slide i'll wait for people to come and get, come to the uh, this is another part this is what i was looking for in terms of you know when you there is a worthlessness and hopelessness something called spiritual distress and when i talk spirituality it doesn't always connect with religion or faith of course religion and faith is one of the ways that you attain spiritual you know uh, spirituality but then there can be distress in several forms which indicates spiritual or existential issues from the for the programish it could be about affirmation forgiveness and you know something about his past or what he has done even like feel it, that he is a burden to his family some could be very worried about you know or thinking about the meaning of life the purpose of life what am i doing what am i what is the meaning of my life and determinism and of course relationship with god and patriotism you know uh like saying that god is meant this for me or you know did god punish me these are the questions for caregivers mainly it comes to clarity in terms of role and of course most importantly hope so what is hope in terms for them and what is the realistic hope for them in the society you have so many societal beliefs and we did talk about stigma taboo the opportunity to share and the community support you know people do not have the chance to go to temples churches or mosques like before and have the system of support that they are used to and for professionals like us there's a lack of clarity to what you know what the situation is going to be we are unable to prioritize we have sometimes skills we all of us don't have skills in all areas sometimes our poor skills in certain areas can affect us and our, of course our own set of beliefs so but we have to realize that spiritual or existential issues are very subjective very private very but very complex it could be very mysterious you know it's it's an all come encompassing feeling and very unique next slide please i just go back to the uh, chat now so there's a lot of suggestions in terms of how we can help the nurse she needs psychological help she needs a safe space to just let it all very good let it all is what i'm going to come in terms of the strategies i'll come back to it edwina it's very important to take a break and pay attention to some things you have be to you know been late late to accomplish i hope bini make her feel important that she's an important member of the care team very good important to get professional help regular breaks we need to nurture our spiritual help where do we find meaning and hope yes so for each one of us there'll be several ways of finding meaning and hope ensuring needs are met as much as possible highlight her contribution allow her to vent out her worries and try to work out a way very good points very good points so again we go to the next slide so ramesh has died and the family have expressed um sorry please go back to the previous slide and his family have expressed thanks and he was not alone and did not suffer for long they found the opportunity to speak and see him over the phone so helpful you're doing a home visit face to face or telephone to offer support you find the family particularly distressed as they would not carry out their prayers and funeral rites they say our families don't even greet us anymore and we have lost the heart of out of the family how will we ever be at peace how will you respond next slide please so you know we are now talking about loss isn't it ramesh is actually passed away 
So the lockdown is actually easing now, but the numbers of people affected by virus is increasing. And everywhere you look, people, you see people who have been impacted, either infected or affected. And then you have people who have been impacted financially. You read stories of migrants who struggle to get home, of businesses going to the wall, of people who could not get healthcare, beds not available, cost of treatment. It's happening all over globally. And you see anger and resentment, but also witness many acts of compassion and kindness. And you ask yourself, how can I make sense of all this? Any thoughts about the last two slides that I mentioned? Next slide, please. We'll wait for your, I'll wait for your comments. Before that, I'll just go to this. I'm sure that you would have seen this in the ebook. I'm not going into the details of this. I'll just go through very quickly in terms of, you know, the, this is the pathway that we have given, the algorithm for psychosocial interventions. So even if it's for yourself, or if it's for others, for patients, for family members, this is an easy pathway that you can use. And if you see the green to red here, this is the distress thermometer. Like the PHQ-9, this is a simple visual and log thermo, uh, scale which you can use to rate distress, just like you do visual and logs rating for pain. So it, uh, it rates from 0 to 10, where 0 has no distress and 10 has extreme distress. So you use your communication skills with reflective listening, open-ended questions, empathize, Elicit the symptoms that we discussed previously. And then you actually, if possible, you can rate the distress. And if the distress, perceived distress is less than four, you can help them with psychoeducation. You can help them with reassurance, normalizing anger, normalizing grief, help them with coping strategies, calming techniques, help them to maintain calm, use, uh, maintain hope, and use your support symptoms. Try to maintain their daily routine activities hobbies and sleep hygiene. If the perceived distress is more than four, they might have to, along the psychoeducation and the strategies that I mentioned, they might need pharmacological intervention. If there's no improvement, I mentioned the red flag signs, they need specialist care. So go through this again. I'm not spending much time on this. Next slide, please. So this is the distress thermometer. You can see this in the ebook too. I just put it so that you become familiar. Next slide, please. So then how can I support? Someone asked me, how would you support? So then I think the main uh, points are that you, your communication skills to maintain therapeutic interaction. So how do you maintain emotional closeness, maintaining a distance, psychoeducation in terms of giving them relevant information as much as they need. Don't bombard them with information and improve the insight and try to normalize the emotional reactions. Much of the emotional reactions you can normalize telling them that this, it's okay to feel like that and we will support you to go through it and help them cope, enhance their coping uh, competence. I think uh, what Edwina said about letting it all out, that is ventilation and validation. So allowing somebody to vent out and you have a non-judgmental approach, listen to them, not pointing out what is right and wrong, but just enabling them to, you know, ventilate that itself is a very very uh, strong process and it will help people you know you know less enlighten their heart crisis management focus on crisis focus on the point you know small problems per day like let us look into this problem today and then go to the next rather than taking the whole situation managing the so whole situation and that is the problem solving approach so you facilitate uh, the problem solving you facilitate the family or even if the person, Ramesh, could have, you know, sort, uh, solved any of his issues, firstly, ask them how, what their problem is. And, you know, you find out the priority for them, agree with them, and then look at ways to, you know, solve it or, you know, try to reduce the burden. Use patients and families, patients who have recovered and families to support others because they can give real experiences and support. As I said before, you have to address the somatic symptoms or the physical symptoms of emotional distress. SSRIs and benzodiazepines are the medications that you use for moderate to severe distress. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like acetylopram, sertraline, it is given in the ebook, and benzodiazepine doses, low risk palm, small doses of it for acute anxiety. Taper it and stop it after two weeks and give it only when there's an acute situation. Unless there is agitation, uncontrolled, you can give parenteral midazolam. I'm going back to the chat. Okay, um, okay, highlights, profiles are getting. Sunita says, making sense, algorithm is given in the page. Thanks, Sunita. 
Next slide, please. So I did talk about burnout. So many have given suggestions, so I don't think I need to say it again. People talked, I know that all of you said about teamwork, you like establishing and maintain a sense of belonging. That's what you, we talked about, the nurse, isn't it? Giving her, give her a sense of belonging. Enable and build emotional and social connectedness. Like it's not always everything about work, you know, blend together, ask them about the, what's happening at home. You know, talk to them about their own issues, which they might be worried, worried about. So focusing on a blend of work and life. And there is self-care. I'm sure Biju must have gone through it in his session. So look into maintaining a range of strategies, you know, which can help. And it should be, it is good if it's a holistic approach and not only a medical. Let us not just medicalize the issue. Let us have a holistic approach to promoting health and well-being. Next slide, please. And we talked about spiritual issues and we said that Moira was asking, how do you connect, how do you maintain meaning and hope? So this is one slide which actually gives you how you can bring in meaning and purpose. So there are many people who actually introspect, reflect on what's happening within them, you know. So there's a lot of connecting inward that happens in them. And also then when you, when you look into yourself, you look into your own coping, your resilience, and look at this stack of pebbles which is kept. They are in different sizes and shapes, and they are placed. Actually, if you look at it, you would feel it would fall over, but it's actually standing there for a long time, isn't it? So all of us are like that, you know. We use we use whatever resources we have, and we become resilient and face the issue. So look into yourself. You yourself, you have a pattern of you know facing challenges through your life, so you know that you're strong. So tell that to the person, you know. They would have several instances where they have showed strength in coping bring out those experiences also if people haven't coped well identify that and help them in coping connecting out connecting outwards look at the nature look at birds look at you know the everything around you sunshine the rains nature the clouds everything brings in a sense of you know this universe and this connectedness to something mysterious and complex beyond you know, what we can actually think. It is so mysterious, but it brings in a lot of peace. And of course, connecting with God in terms of prayer and faith. I'm just going to the chat. So Dr. Pranav says, respect the right to make their own decisions, which is absolutely correct. We should respect them. We should respect the family also in making their own decisions. Help them do it. Facilitate them. Provide information with honesty. What we know, if unknown to me, admit. That's a very good point, Dr. Pranab. Like we have this fear of saying, I don't know. And we should actually say, I don't know if we don't know. That's why I said, remember I said poor skills. So I might not be good at managing many things. So I should be saying. Uh, okay, maybe. Any suggestions from uh, you? In, I just said about how we can maintain meaning and hope. Any so Maryam says, I find my hope in faith. Sunita says, my faith gives meaning in my life. Uh, for me personally, I think my connection with my uh, you know, family, my friends, my, my, my uh, energy comes from looking after people around me. And that gives me a great sense of you know, uh, existence. I don't know if it makes sense, but for, for me. Yes, Charu, that's a very good, important point that we should not impose our ways on them, especially when it's related to religion and faith. We should be careful that we don't impose our ways on them. Support and love from family and friends. Very good points. Moira says, for me, faith is important and also beauty such as sunset and nature. Yeah. And Moira actually spends a lot of time photo, ha, taking these wonderful photographs. So we also keep these memories or, you know, we capture these screenshots from what gives us meaning, isn't it? Either we carry photos of our, of God, of our family, of nature. So we keep those as a source of strength for us. So we can bring in meaning and purpose in several ways. Next slide, please. I'm just touching upon grief also. And as we all know, grief or, you know, grief is the process of when you lose someone, you know, the emotional process that you go through in terms of adaptation or adjusting to a loss. And the loss especially is when it's of a dear one or a loved one, it becomes extremely traumatic for a person. So grief, but is very normal and natural. All of us go through when we lose uh, someone, lose anything which is very dear to us, especially when it's a person. And it has got, uh, you know, all the components that would be say like emotional, cognitive in terms of thoughts, 
social aspects of it, spiritual aspects of it, and the physical aspects of it. Next slide, please. So bereavement is the state of, you know, uh, of loss. Like when you lose someone to death, then you are bereaved of that person. So that is bereavement. And bereavement in the pandemic actually has several, several implications, which are very new, which is more complicated due to the changes in the traditional societal mourning process. People are not allowed to take part in funerals. People are not allowed to mourn in the open and expressive way. Many of the cultures are not very private in terms of mourning. They express it. They get together as families, as gatherings, and they openly actually express, cry out. There is also some, some societies which wail openly. So uh, all, that's, all that is restricted. People are pushed to uh, their own ways of mourning. Uh, funerals, burials, and gatherings are governed by strict guidelines like cremations and burials actually are which are they are changing now like the government was doing it and now because they don't have the capacity or the manpower to do it now it has been given given over and then um, the other uh, other uh, authorities are doing it but then there is now a fear of increasing infection because of that because we don't know how far the guidelines are being managed so these are all specific issues which are coming because you know which is related to uh, the loss of a person. And these itself can actually cause a lot of distress in the family members. And we have to learn to really be empathetic, prepared for this. So we prepare ourselves when we know a person is going to die, we actually communicate with the family beforehand and prepare them and prepare ourselves and have this plan of what to do so that we, we don't actually fumble when it happens. So it's very important to look into this point. Next slide, please. So again, I'm not going into this in detail, but then you have this algorithm of for grief on page 41. So how do you identify grief? Like, you know, you go through stages of grief, like shock, denial, guilt, blaming, bargaining with life and God, and then searching and recalling, and then finally coming into a state of uh, acceptance. The important point is that we have to rule out depression and assess suicide risk again when they are grieving too. And they should be targeted psychosocial interventions like normalizing the grieving process, communication, allow ventilation and validation, talk, them, talk to them about the loss and the death. So we have to bring the, we should not, uh, you know, avoid talking about that, but we should talk about the person who has died in terms of past tense so that it brings in the reality to the person. Bring in memories of the deceased person, use support systems and virtual funerals, help them to find it. When it is very difficult and prolonged or complicated grief, when the person is not really coping and not getting back to their normal sense, regular follow-up is important and also refer them. Palliative care units, again, with mental health professionals, a very good support system in the family for this. I'm going back to the chat once again. Yes, for me, faith is important. Edwina says, my faith is my mainstay. Such good uh, points coming in. Sunita says, past experiences, good or bad. Yeah. Next slide, please. So a summary, I'm just uh, summarizing mental health issues are significant in the context of COVID-19 with specific challenges to be aware of. Identifying assessment and management of psychosocial issues can be carried out by the primary team. Addressing spiritual needs is absolutely necessary to deliver total care. Managing loss and grief to be considered a priority during COVID-19. And please, the algorithms and supporting documents are easy to follow and easy to practice in your clinical situation. Next slide, please. So you, next slide, you have the further resources. Next slide. Next slide, please. And you have the contributors and I thank you for your patient listening. Next slide, please. And there is your link for the feedback. I would wait for it, but then before that, I would wait for a few minutes for some more chat and questions from you. And I help, I, I would uh, ask, help from Moira and Charu and Sunita to help deal with the questions. So Moira is asking, are there any questions or points you want to make? So Praveen, Dr. Praveen Jacob is saying, how can the doctor who has been asked to vacate his rented home respond? That's a very, very tricky question actually, because uh, if it's a very uh, volatile situation, he has to first focus on his own care. So he probably would have to remove himself from that situation and find out how the authorities can help him. So probably reporting to the authority to find out what else can be done. 
and also probably in his own flat and building many, many of the buildings have now a protocol or a you know how they should treat how sh they should look into people actually coming for quarantine or people who are working they have a policy now most of the buildings associations have it so probably he should actually go and talk to the uh, their uh, building or their association or the residential persons um, so redmi i don't know who is of redmi they asking the reference slide once more so i think uh, to report report in not in the sense of complaints but to discuss with any management and their own hospital authorities and also probably uh, let the authorities like the local administration, the district administration or the collector know that this is happening. So that there is a policy because many of the collectors of districts came back with, uh, you know, came with the policy that people, uh, the healthcare workers should not be asked to vacate from their flats. It came like that. So that is one. It's, it, I think in many places, those regulations are not in place. You know, I think yeah. that's very unique to some places. Yeah. So I think yeah. your point about making yourself safe and secure and then seeing if the community roundabout yeah. can try and help yeah. with some of these issues, trying not get into a fight, you yes. know, uh, with regulatory authorities, although it may need to come to that. But more than that, who in the community can meet the fears of the neighbors that are causing that, I think is the yeah. question. Yes. yes. I think, yeah, that is that is exactly what I said that please, uh, we should avoid conflict and, you know, aggressive situations and remove yourself, stay, you know, place yourself in a protected kind of situation. Don't allow yourself to be treated badly. And then, of course, uh, whatever community support you can get in terms of diffusing or, you know, clarifying and giving more information about the uh, COVID-19 and that you are not bringing in the virus. I think that would be thing. How would you differentiate between grief and depression? Uh, Charu, grief is actually a state which comes with a loss and then it goes through stages, like I said, but it would have emotional turbulence, lack of sleep and everything. But uh, depression is more of a clinical state which has a longer duration, more pervasive in terms of uh, low mood and uh, lack of interest, lack of energy. Uh, and they would have definitely have more of, you know, negative thoughts, uh, sometimes suicidal ideas, ideas of helplessness, hopelessness, and worthlessness, which is not seen much in grief. Grief is more about searching for that person, having memories about that person, uh, you know, uh, missing that person, and uh, feeling very sad for that loss. Uh, did that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Can I add one more thing here? Yeah, please uh, do. Uh, after the uh, COVID crisis broke out and uh, uh, messages, uh, news started coming out, that doctors and nurses were being targeted by uh, society uh, because they're carrying the coronavirus and that uh, stigma that was associated with them. So I think now the government has a rule that if there is any violence or any uh, uh, action against uh, a doctor, the police will, uh, uh, they can be arrested and they have heavy fines of three to five lakh rupee fines. Uh, okay. If they are uh, uh, violent or aggressive towards uh, healthcare professionals. Thank you, thank you, Charu. Arun, can you close the uh, screen sharing? Stop the sharing. What, what about our friends from other places, from Mercy Ships, from Ghana? Any experiences there about how these things are working out? You can unmute and talk. You can unmute yourself. Please uh, feel free to talk. I'll just go to the chat for the last few kind of uh, comments. Dr. Dinesh says, move. This is Edwina from Ghana. In, yeah. terms of, um, in terms of people um, asking you to leave your apartments or homes, that is, uh, that is very, I haven't heard of health workers having to leave okay. their homes because okay. uh, they are being evicted by their landlord or so. Okay. But um, what, what has happened is that in the, host, the, uh, in the beginning, when we were running out of, we, we didn't have options for treatment centers. A few people had built clinics or facilities yeah. that could be used as treatment centers, schools, or they identified home, um, vacant homes in, um, in certain communities that could be used as treatment centers, and the community rose against those. 
okay. because they felt that they were too close to yeah. their own homes and they were very afraid that um, they would be infected. So there was one private clinic, new hospital that had been built and uh, uh, it got it got shut down. <laughs> the idea how, got shut down very so quickly. How, how did you all manage that situation? Did it did the community itself or the authorities take some step, or uh, did did you address that as a community in some way, or? So the authorities they tried to um, address the issues in some of the places, um, communicating to them that it is you're not likely to get an infection just because you live in the same neighborhood as a, fa a facility that has and so and so uh, that has patients with COVID-19. Um, however, I'm not too sure that the private hospital was open for that. Okay. I think it worked for some other communities, but not. Yeah. Yeah. I the, think it also the, varies, maybe, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Some of the other issues were that um, patients who had been treated for COVID-19, when they got back home, mm -hmm. um, they, they, they ran into problems. That mm -hmm. has been an issue. I think it is varying across countries and across states in India also. Each state has, you know, has been showing stigma and you know, discrimination and in various ways to healthcare workers and to patients and families and each uh, community then develops a system or to help. So like uh, uh, we had said that there have been such acts, but we have also been seeing acts of compassion and kindness to a high, very high level. So it happens as a balance, I suppose, like, you know, thing. Any other questions? Yeah, um, with Mercy Ships, we, we actually are not uh, um, exposed to COVID because we moved from Senegal when the, the numbers started going up, so they moved us to Spain. But the difficult part was leaving our patients because um, we really didn't get any warning ahead of time. And so we had to, we didn't really prepare them for that. But the good thing that happened with, is that we had trained people, local people. And so they are the people following up on them on daily basis and okay. they give us um feedbacks that um are good so okay um when it comes to exposure we are actually not exposed on the ship and um okay yeah all right thank you so much any other comments or questions or moira has also asked whether you know can you please uh, share with us the main things that we have learned over this week and how you plan to move forward if we get a few points from you we would be very happy chitra i just have to share one incident yeah can I, do I have no, the please, time? Please, please, please yeah. quickly. Yeah. The hospital in Pala, yeah. it has a, a patient who is terminally ill. She might go today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Her son is coming from UAE, leaving his job just to see his mother. And that's the only thing that lady is waiting for. Mm -hmm. But we have asked the authorities to cooperate and they said absolutely no way that the son is coming anywhere near that hospital. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it happens, the whole entire hospital will be sealed and all of us will have to go into quarantine. Yeah. Such a helpless situation yes. gives us all such a feeling of guilt. We yes. really don't know how to go about it. Yeah, that is the moral distress I was talking about. <coughs> because these are situations we cannot control, but we cannot uh, go beyond that also because for the safety of the larger uh, you know, society or the community, isn't it? But then it does definitely leave you know, an impact on us and the, you know, the family. So it is very, you know, uh, difficult situation. There is no quick answer to that, but thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. Can we have some main learnings over the week that uh, you main, you know, something which you're going to carry, you know, if you can give us a few points and also like, how would this help you in your practice? Uh, other than the feedback you would definitely do in terms of the webinar and the echo session, we would like a you know, few statements from all of you on the chat in terms of, or you can unmute and say also. We have a few minutes more. Everyone is quiet. I hope it's a reflection 
I think they're writing. I think it's okay. <laughs> Hello, yeah, Aisha. Did you want to say anything, Aisha? You can even type on the chat if you're not able to uh, connect to the audio properly. So Dr. Pranab has come saying, thank you all very much. Mind regulates the physical status and so psychological approach, approach in palliative care deserves value and it's a need. Very, very true. Thank you so much, Dr. Pranab. Dr. Sanjeev is saying, I got to know that things that we are suffering are not single events, so we need to stand together. Dr. Chankar says, learn to be patient, listen, empathize, know the limitation of medical science, love, compassion, heal, thyself. Very good points. Chitra, I think that's lovely to see that yeah. sense of togetherness yeah. because we can feel pretty alone sometimes. So that's one of the advantages of being together for these discussions and these learnings is yeah. to, to feel that we're not alone, which yeah. is important. Especially when you are isolated and, you know, you feel that, okay, Dr. Tanvi has written practical aspect of how to manage family. Yes, thank you. All right, I hope that you would uh, give us more feedback in your forms as well. Uh, Moira is uh, asking something again. And uh, do we have time till 4.15? Uh, Arun? Yes, ma'am. Do we have, how much minutes do we have? How many more minutes? Ma'am, uh, six minutes. All right. So Moira says that please do something today to, to care for yourself and each other. Very true. Dr. Jagrati says active listening and compassionate communication is a key in this uncertainty. Yes, very true. I think um, uh, mental health has come up in a way that, you know, which is like a, another... Uh, it is said to be another uh, pandemic, a simple epidemic in mental health issues, which are going to come up, you know, along with and after uh, this pandemic. There's so much more coming up. Uh, we are getting patients uh, because of the challenges in uh, uh, coping with online education. So we have started in our OPs, people are coming with panic attacks, teachers, students, uh, they are not able to cope with online education. Something we have developed for mitigating you know the issues due to the COVID in terms of education but that itself is causing a lot of uh, mental health issues concerns so new things might emerge and again we need to communicate empathize establish relationship and try to help them uh, cope with the stress yeah and I think if um, I can say something this training has really been a, a very good start for for us on mercy ships because we haven't been exposed to um, COVID patients and going back to Senegal, um, we, it's, it has been a very relevant um, training. So that would help me personally to, to know how to handle such um, conditions when I get back. That's great to hear. And uh, some people have asked if they can translate or adapt any of the algorithms and materials. So please just get in touch with us. And we'll happily, happily help, help to do that and just to uh, um, you know, acknowledge the work that's been done. But it's exciting for us to see this being relevant for people in other settings. And it's yeah. a continual learning for us as faculty too. So Dr. Anupama says the significance of having a holistic approach and amalgamation of clinical acumen, pharmacological principles and communication. Rajini says, thank you for an exhaustive comprehensive se session covering all the nuances of mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual pain that patients, families, and healthcare experience. 
these have been heightened and made more difficult to address. The discussion was useful in knowing we are not alone. Thank you for the enriching sessions. Mental issues a challenge. Communication, let us not fight with that. Death, accept, improve quality of life, give best care. Um, okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for uh, your uh, patient listening and uh, so much of interaction and uh, feedback. Uh, Dr. Lelis says, I feel now society needs more compassionate counselors. Uh, thanks. Um, I hope all of you enjoyed the whole week and also are uh, going back with some messages that you can impart to your own team members because we want you to also take the role of imparting what you learn to others and give us a feedback for, for the webinars and the ebook and echo sessions, please, so that we would, uh, we are looking at updating and improvising and improving the quality of the resource tool. Uh, toolkit and we need your feedback for that. Thank you so much. Thanks Moira. Thanks Charu. Thanks Sunita. Thanks Geeta. All the team of uh, uh, Tali COVID Care for co constantly being there. I know it's very exhausting for us. We are doing this in between work and we have been doing this for the past two months now. But thanks for holding on. Thanks for holding on. Yeah, ma'am, thank you. Uh, I have a kind request. Please attend this call before you leave because it is very extremely important to us.